Well, good evening, everyone. We're going to start and uh, appreciate you being here. This is Martin Luther uh, King Day, and uh, so some people may have thought, my goodness, they wouldn't have even a class on a holiday. You don't know me very well, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I always have classes on holidays, and the primary reason is, if you don't, because of Mondays, you like have half the classes. So you just need to, to press on. I mean, we move into February, we have President's Day, and uh, you know, this one holiday after another. So um, yes, indeed, we are meeting tonight, and for, we have a uh, you know decent group considering it's uh, uh, Martin Luther King Day. It's glad you're here. And for everyone else watching online, uh, glad you're here also. Um, this is kind of a special day for me in that tomorrow my wife and I leave for Nevada and I leave her there. Um, I'll come back uh, Wednesday, the following week, um, and uh, I will be without my honey. So that'll be a challenge for three months. Um, she's coming to visit at the end of February, and she's going to come to visit also at uh, Easter. And so uh, I will see her then. And uh, my plan is that I'll be uh, departing for Nevada on April 16th, which is the Sunday after Easter. And um, I don't know if I mentioned this last week, but it looks like we're going to be having Easter at the Tillis Center again. Um, so it'll be a fun last service for me to to be back at the Tillis Center. I will not be preaching, but I'll have the chance to to worship and celebrate with everyone. I think it will be a a, a great uh, Sunday morning. So we're going to uh, begin with a word of prayer. Let's do that. Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to worship you through the reading and listening and learning from your word. We're praying, Father, that you would bless this journey, make it useful for growing us to be the men and women that you have called us to be. And we pray, Father, for uh, just your guidance in our lives, that things that we learn from Jeremiah or through other passages of Scripture will come to our mind by your Holy Spirit and refresh us and strengthen us and give us the hope that we need to live each day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So for anyone watching online, um, we're going to be doing the quiz now. And how you access the quiz is you go to the Shelter Rock Church webpage. On top, you'll see a button that says events. You click on that and you go to the small groups. Uh, type in the word Jeremiah. This class shows up. Become a member. And then you have access to everything that's on that page. Resources. And one of the resources will be the uh, uh, Jeremiah quiz, which uh, tonight is quiz uh, six, 15, yeah, 16, and it is uh, our quiz mostly based on the previous week's material. Uh, we do that so we don't have too broad of information and to give our brother Ken a chance to get his 100, you know, but, uh, you know, we, if, you keep, if we keep it narrowed, yes. You know, if, if I say it's going to be on verses 1 to 3, you know, and that's it, um, we'll, we'll figure that out. Um, but yes, yeah, so let's, let's take a look at the quiz and uh, see how we do. I, I would not call this an easy quiz, but I would not call it super hard. So here we go. In the Book of Consolation, we see a movement in poetry between Babylon and Judah, Masculine and feminine, light and dark, strength and weakness. Now, to know this, you would have to be in class and to have, you know, gone over it a little bit. But for those of you who were, you well have picked masculine and feminine. And our brother Ken is happy he got that one correct. God bless him. And uh, Barbara and Wayne, I don't know if you watched online this week, but you, then you got that one, I'm sure. Beautiful beautiful. And, and by the way, that's one of the pluses of poetry. You can play with things like that. You know, as I, I have to admit, when I was in grade school, I hated poetry. I'm like, I don't even understand this. You know, it's some poem by E.E. E. Cummings or even Walt Whitman. And I'm like, this doesn't make sense to me. Sometimes it did, 
uh, two roads diverged in the middle of a wood and I took the one less traveled by. You know, that was a beautiful poem. But other times it's like these abstract things that make no sense to me. But poetry for us, just like for them, is able to reach beyond even a normal narrative. You're able to express feelings, emotions, and, and using the, in this case, masculine and feminine uh, actually adds to the feel of the poetry. The imagery of the language can remind the reader of what other prophet. Now this was brought up in class. So if you were here, you probably figured it out. Micah, Song of Songs, Hosea, Daniel. And the answer is Hosea. This is where the prophet is told to marry a prostitute. And then after she doesn't break from her habits and her old job, she ends up incarcerated and Jeremiah, excuse me, Hosea is told to buy her back. Get her out. Take your wife back. And God is giving the illustration. That's what it's like loving Israel. Um, it's, Israel is not a faithful uh, nation. Now, Song of Songs could have been tempting because it is a, a, a book on passion, and, but I didn't refer to it. And it's not a prophet. It is a love story, um, an interesting love story. Micah, uh, written before the time of Jeremiah and is not of that kind of emotive nature. And then, of course, uh, Daniel is some narrative and some prophetic, but not what we're referring to. Um, by the way, Karen, do you remember what verse I tried to teach Limbrook yesterday? Micah 3 8. But as for me, <laughs> I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, with justice and with might. <laughs> very good, very good. I, uh, that was an impromptu. I felt like, yeah, I'm going to go over this verse and, and see it. <laughs> by, the, by the way, I, I, when I was preaching at Lindbergh Baptist yesterday, I find that if you teach something with motions, just like with kids, grown-ups get it a little more. So at the very end, I use the motions that I did with the kids to teach this verse, which is, again, Micah 3.8. As for me, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, with justice, and with might. And by the time we finished it, everyone was going like this, you know, the whole congregation, and it was just kind of fun. I've done it at VBS with the kids, and that's how you help kids, you know, learn things. But um, it was a lot of fun. At least it was fun for me. <laughs> Number three. One of the interesting additions in the poem are references to Assyria, Egypt, northern Israel, and Sheba. Now, this could be tough for some of you, but the answer is northern Israel in the term of Ephraim. And, and what's going on there and why this stands out is because suddenly we have imagery that there's going to be one nation again in the future. And so that is northern Israel. There's going to be one nation. But as I mentioned last week, and it didn't make everyone's attention, Karen, um, is <laughs> isn't it terrible the way I call people out? You know, shame people publicly like Arlene coming in late, you know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I can't help it. You know, it's this evil, sadistic side. <laughs> you know, when you marry a woman who's filled with sarcasm, you do pick up a little bit of it yourself. And uh, Michelle is wired that way, and I've had to live with it, and so it's, it's you know, come rubbed off on me a little bit, you know, as we move on. But yes, um, the, po the words we referred to last week were the terms of endearment used for Israel, which, northern Israel, which is Ephraim. Um, and that came up several times, and we pointed that out. But it is northern Israel, which, again, the point is... The poetry was showing there was once again going to be one nation. One nation's coming. Number four. In the Book of Consolation, we see an abundance of weeping, blessings, fear, judgment. 
Now, for this, I would like you to read the sentence carefully. In the book of consolation. <laughs> Do you think we see lots of weeping? Lots of fear? Lots of judgment? No, we see a lot of blessing. A lot of blessing. Not all, but that is the dominant theme. So I was hoping that that would be one that would be easier for some. You know, one of the principles of taking any test is read the question carefully. And so even if you don't know the official answer, you can say, hmm, consolation, that sounds closer to one than the other. And the fact that the others were the opposite, I was hoping to be gracious in that. You know, to, that, was, that was grace, just pouring down like oil on Aaron's beard, you know, just pouring, in, um, which is a psalm, by the way. All right, number five. Rachel weeping for her children has fulfillment in which horizons? A, horizon one. B, horizon two. C, horizon three. None of the above. Now, I will say that there's going to be grace on this question, but the two solid answers are horizon one and horizon two. Horizon one is because the people are going under the siege. It's awful. It's terrible. And it's scary. You know, it's, it's, it's gruesome. Rachel becomes a type of a mother of Israel. She's a mother of some, but not all of Israel. But she becomes a type and is definite fulfillment in horizon one, which is Jeremiah's time frame. But there's also fulfillment, according to Matthew, in horizon two, the time of Jesus, because Matthew uses this verse to refer to Herod killing the young children in Bethlehem. And so that is the fulfillment number two, horizon two. Now here's the grace. Could you refer to it in the tribulation also, which is to come? Yeah, you could make an argument for that. Not an overt argument, but there is subtle imagery of that. So if you put one, two, and three, you can give yourself the correct answer. I can't say for sure that it wouldn't include three, but the two dominant ones are horizon one and horizon two. Number six, while Judah was previously compared to a prostitute, now she is called a virgin, a dear son. Child, I delight, daughter Israel. And the answer is all of them. So the one who was called the prostitute is now called all these endearing terms. And that's, you know, beautiful. And it kind of, that's why we have the Hosea imagery, that even though Israel makes so many errors and, and choices to willfully disobey, God still calls Israel a virgin. Uh, I, years, not years ago, uh, I think it was possibly a sermon I gave in the summer, maybe in the spring, but it's from a passage in Deuteronomy in which Israel is called Jeshurun. Jeshurun. And what's so interesting about that is Jeshurun actually means my righteous one. And Israel was anything but righteous. But actually, God comes up with a name to call Israel my righteous one. By the way, something I have, I will admit I've struggled with this myself, but I really think there are reasons to do it. We often do not speak over the people we love words of what we would like them to be, as compared to words of what we see in terms of it. In other words, I would, you know, love to uh, see my kids all make the perfect decisions. But do my kids all make the perfect decisions? They don't. They make poor decisions sometimes. And so I tend to hold back my praise because you could have done better. You know, that's what I'm thinking. And I, and I realize that often... The parents who affirm what they know their child could be often have children that start living up 
to what you're hoping for for them in terms of using those terms and you know graciousness and I look at my own family I'm the youngest child you know so I have two older brothers and my parents always spoke more truth you might say to my older brothers than they did to me so they they like when I did a sermon my parents parents were like oh that was amazing you know they're clapping they're like all this I'm like it wasn't that good <laughs> you know but it was mom and dad you know always celebrating you know what their son but I noticed they did it more with me their youngest son than they did with my older brothers and I feel that in life I had the chance to get more traction and accomplish things because I felt I had parents that actually believed I could be even what I was not so I think taking a page out of the Lord here and he might be a good person to emulate I don't know just thinking maybe it's good to emulate the Lord maybe it is good to say to our spouse our children what we are hoping from them not necessarily everything we're seeing right now which is not necessarily so good and so I, I want to get better at that there's this uh, young woman uh, just turned 16 and I'm kind of a mentor to her and she just got a report card and the report card was like C C C C C and she posted on Facebook that uh, I got my report card I passed everything and everyone's writing congratulations that's wonderful that's awesome and I'm thinking she can do better than C you know so I, I was thinking what do I put because what I want to put is we can do better but she was just thrilled that she passed everything which she hasn't always done in the past and so I said something like uh, great start for aiming for even better something like that um, and then I was thinking was that right was that, I don't know I'm not good at this but it's hard for me to like say that's an amazing C <laughs> you know incredible um, did anyone have you guys ever seen the movie uh, Parenthood with Steve Martin um, it's, a, it's a funny movie but he in the movie he's like envisioning the future and his his son is now a sniper on t at Texas A&M University and he's like shooting down he's he's screaming out to his father you made me play second base because he like did bad at second base and now he's a sniper at the school and then so as he's shooting Steve Martin's character goes good shot son you know, <laughs> trying to like encourage him in his you have to see it but in any case I know because what I'm saying is like people are like what is he talking about I don't understand never mind I'll move on <laughs> number seven who has an amazing dream giving restful sleep Shemaiah Baruch Jeremiah Hanamel and I hope you all got this right Jeremiah he wakes up and he's like oh that was a good one that was a good dream I hope you guys have them sometimes you know I tell you my favorite dreams right now are when I dream of my dad and we are having conversation he passed away 2014 November 12th and you know the last five years of his life he was so frail from Parkinson's and the last two years almost non-communicative but when I have a dream and he's at a vibrant stage in life and we're having a conversation and I wake up I say thank you Lord for that I appreciate that I, I enjoyed talking to healthy dad um, it kind of like leapfrogs the Parkinson's to you know what I expect my father to be in glory and uh, that was that was nice number eight which New Testament book contains a long quote the longest from Jeremiah 31 Matthew Hebrews Romans Revelation and the answer is the book of Hebrews now I've mentioned this in time to time Revelation interestingly enough 
has no quotes from the Old Testament, but it alludes to the Old Testament more than any New Testament book. In other words, unless you know the Old Testament, you can't understand Revelation. That's why Revelation is such a mystery to people. They don't know the Old Testament. So they read it and they go, what in the world is going on here? But if you're very familiar with the Old Testament, things start popping all over the place. We will see an example of that uh, tonight. But uh, Hebrews is the one that has the long quote. Number nine. What is Jeremiah instructed to buy? What is Jeremiah instructed to buy? A clay jar, a yoke, a field, a belt. I would probably argue this may be the hardest question tonight, which Ken's getting a little nervous there. I thought this was pretty easy, this question. And because it doesn't apply just to last week, it applies to his life in the prophetic ministry. And the answer is everything except a yoke. He was asked by God to make a yoke, not to buy one. That's why a yoke is not included. But all of those things were props. If you remember the clay jar, he had to buy it and smash it in front of Zedekiah. A field he was supposed to buy from his cousin who was coming, and that was going to be from his hometown of Anathoth. And the belt, remember he was to buy a belt and then bury it and come back much later, and it was all rotted and decayed. And so all those three were things he was to buy, but the yoke he was to construct. Um, so that's why I'm saying it was a harder question, I think. Did anyone get that right exactly? One of them. One of them, right. <laughs> I, what I mean by right is A, C, and D. Did you get A, C, and D, all those three? No. Oh, okay. Anyone get A, C, and D? <clears throat> See, I told you, that's a hard one. In some respects, easy in the sense that you probably recognize all of those things pertain to Jeremiah, but you're like, well, I'm assuming he bought the yoke. He had to get it somewhere. Well, he had to make it, just like I made it from my prop when I preached. Didn't, did it actually say he purchased a belt? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Go to the potter's house and buy a, a clay jar. Go to the such and such and buy a belt. Um, but with the yoke, make it. Last one. Jeremiah mentions a new covenant. Which of the following is not in it? Is not in it. Write the law on your hearts as compared to just parchment. They will know the Lord. There will be no more sickness. God will remember their sins no more. And the answer is no more sickness. That is not in the covenant. Kind of wish that one was in the covenant personally, but that was not in the covenant. Okay, I'm taking it, Ken, this was not the test. That was going to be that. <laughs> you know, I wrote next week's already. Because, and, and if you, you know, maybe you can pay me. I can give you a copy in advance or something. <laughs> now, uh, next week, by the way, uh, Peter Lesneski is going to be here teaching. Um, I already got the cookies for him and the quiz is all ready. Um, and so it's all set for Peter to speak. He said to me, Steve, I can't teach as long as you because I don't tell the stories you tell. You know, and I uh, was like, well, make up some stories, Peter. You, you. The truth is, every one of you can tell stories. It's just a question of remembering them and having them be applicable or something like that. But I personally think stories help things to pop, you know, because it, it helps people remember and, you know, brings things to life um, in terms of what's going on. So we are now leaving the book of consolation, excuse me. Yeah, we, I could say that. We're leaving the book of consolation. However, we got chapter 33. That's part of the book of consolation. So this I know is on the quiz next week because I already wrote it. 
What chapters are the book of Consolation? It is chapter 30, 31, 32, 33. So those four chapters are book of consolation. In the past, I may have said it was three chapters, and if I did, I was mistaken. It is four chapters, 30, 31, 32, 33. So tonight, we finish up the book of consolation. In fact, chapter 33, in some respects, is a remembrance of chapter 32. It's like going to repeat a lot of stuff. But that is... Um, uh, important to know it is it is on the, the 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 test sometimes called the book of comfort not just consolation and the hope resides not in Israel getting its act together the hope resides simply in God's mercy that's where the hope is and quite honestly that's the hope of the gospel too because none of us get to heaven because we're good. We get to heaven because God is kind. It's mercy that brings us there. And so that is ultimately what we are needing. And we find hope in what is not yet. Not yet. In other words, all this positive stuff is going to come, but right now they're in, under siege. Right now, things are still grim. They're not good. But hope is there because they know of a glorious future yet to come. And I think that hope is for us too. I was riding on my scooter today. And it's a little chilly out. And so when it's chilly, I have to think of things to take my mind off how cold it is as I'm riding my scooter. But one of the things that I was thinking of is the very last prayer recorded in the Bible. Does anyone know what that prayer is? Even so, come, Lord Jesus. It's a very simple prayer. Jesus, come. Now, there are some people who fear the coming of Jesus because they're living in sin. But the truth is, if that is what happens, meaning he rejects you because he caught you living in sin when he returned, then it's salvation by works. And it's not. It's salvation by grace. So even when we have a bad day, it's still salvation by grace. It's all about mercy. And so that, for example, for me today, thinking that Jesus is coming back was just a warm feeling that I needed for today. I, I just needed it, particularly as it was freezing on the scooter. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, I, I just put this up here just to remind us where we are. And if you could see on the bottom, right after Jehoiachin, you move over and you get Zedekiah. And Zedekiah is the king in this chapter, which is the last king. And... Uh, it moves over because of the relation, son of Josiah, um, what's happening. And Zedekiah is officially a vassal king. You know, vassal means he agreed to pay tribute to Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar put him in power as long as he honored his deal that he was going to be a vassal, meaning pay tribute, pay taxes, to Nebuchadnezzar, and though he would be part of the Babylonian Empire. But as we know, remember when Jeremiah was carrying that yoke around? That was when there was a council in Jerusalem in which Zedekiah was trying to say, hey, why don't we all, uh, you know, fight against Babylon? We'll win, you know. And Jeremiah says, that's a mistake. You will not win. You will not win. So that is you know, where they are. This is the Babylonian Empire, which is vast. Um, so if you can imagine, this vast empire is now coming down against Jerusalem or Judah. Judah, the region, Jerusalem, the city. And it's, it's looking grim in terms of uh, what's going to happen. So chapter 33, we drop in verse 1. 
when Jeremiah was still confined in the courtyard of the guard, so he is imprisoned by Zedekiah, the word of the Lord came to him a second time. And by the way, what was the first word? Go buy a field. You're getting a relative. He's going to come. He's going to sell you a worthless piece of land. Go buy it, Jeremiah. Thank you, Lord. You just make my prophetic ministry so easy. You know, so he buys the worthless piece of land. But the prophetic message, if you recall, was that one day this land will have value again. So keep the deed in a clay jar so it lasts a long time. But now comes a second word from the Lord, which is this. This is what the Lord says. He who made the earth, the Lord, who formed it and established it, the Lord is his name. I'd say that's a pretty good resume to start off with here. So I who made everything have this to say. Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. This verse throws me back to working at Word of Life camp back when I was 17 years old and I was a cook there. And because I was working there for the summer, we had a, an older uh, gentleman who was in charge of our cabin. And he was from the south. And he began every like Bible study we ever had with, my favorite verse is Jeremiah 33, 3. Call to me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things thou knowest not. And it's like, okay, by the end of that summer, I knew that verse because he quoted it every single time we got together. Now, this is a promise to who? So the simplest way to look at this is while Jeremiah was still confined, the word of the Lord came to him. So it's a word to Jeremiah. And the word you, by the way, this is on the quiz next week because I already wrote it. I'm giving you all my secrets here. You is singular. It is a singular you. So he's telling Jeremiah, call to me and I will answer you and show you great and unsearchable things you do not know. That being said, the commentator I read, I think, rightly said it's a verse that you can take too. Because repeated all through Scripture is the Lord telling his people, call to me. Call to me. So you and I can call to the Lord and say, you know, Lord, show me great and unsearchable things I do not know. Now, he doesn't give you a major download of, you know, here's everything you need to know. He tends to give you what you need for the moment you need it. Famous story of Corey Ten Boom. She's getting, uh, uh, she's asking her father, "What is death like?" And if you remember, Corey Ten Boom is the woman who survived the Holocaust and ended up being a, a preacher for the next forty years of her life. But she asked her dad, "What is death like?" Now that's a great question for any kid to ask. And her father paused and said, when we go on the train, when do I give you your ticket? And Corey responded, right before I get on the train. Because no father who has any wisdom is going to give the train ticket to their young kid a week in advance. They will not know where it is. They will lose it. And so the father gives it right before you need it. Here's your ticket. And then dad said, that is what death is like. God gives you what you need when you need it. And that was just to give her the comfort that when your time comes, you will have what you need from the Lord, but not before him. So in this particular case, in our own, in receiving the answers, the unsearchable things, God says, call to me. So by all means, call to him. But the unsearchable things he gives you the answer to may come when you need it, not like way in advance before you have reason to need it. So great verse. You can memorize it. Good verse to know. He goes on. 
For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says about the houses in this city. Now, this is not a happy thing. And the royal palaces of Judah that have been torn down and used against the siege ramps and the sword in the fight with the Babylonians. They will be filled with dead bodies. And uh, of the people I will slay in my anger and wrath. I will hide my face from this city because of all its wickedness. Now, get this connection. Who's attacking Jerusalem? The Babylonians or Nebuchadnezzar. Who is taking responsibility for the deaths? The Lord. And just like Nebuchadnezzar is his servant, the Lord recognizes I take responsibility for what you were doing. And now this Hebrew idiom comes up. I will hide my face. Remember the, the blessing in Numbers 6? The Lord bless you and keep you. Make the Lord's face shine upon you. That's the positive. In this case, the Lord is saying, I'm not going to shine my face on you. So let's say your life is going great. You know what you can say? The Lord is shining his face upon me. It's that, that is a Hebraic way of talking. It's not that I'm actually seeing a luminescent face you know, in the sky. It's that I realize I have so many good things in my life. He is shining his face upon me. I told you the story you know, recently about the doctor saying you might have a mass in your lungs. And it just caused me to pause and take stock of my life. Uh, in case you didn't hear the rest of the story, everything's fine. But what happened, it really gave me a chance to pause and say, my life is so blessed. I mean, really blessed. I, I wrote a letter to somebody and I, and I told them the letter, you know, I've been to Ghana, Mozambique, South Africa, Mongolia, China, Taiwan, uh, Nicaragua, uh, and I was just going down to Hungary, uh, France, Netherlands, England, just all these different places, married to a same woman for 37 years, four kids, all born healthy, and, and great job. And you pause and you say, thank you, Lord. He's shined his face on me. I can't say anything else but that. We're going to pray for your blessing there, Mary. Would you like somebody to get you a glass of water at all? I have water. Okay. She's, she came equipped. She came equipped. Well, we hope you feel better. As somebody who just recovered from having a cough, I particularly hope you feel better. because It's very, uh, very frustrating. So, verse 6. Oh, oh, by the way, I should say, this section we just read is almost identical to chapter 32, the last chapter, verse 28 and 29. So he's repeating. In other words, we're hearing the same theme again. Now verse 6. Nevertheless, I will bring health and healing to it. I will heal my people and will let them enjoy abundant peace and security. Now, this is what we call grace. They don't deserve it. I will bring Judah and Israel back from captivity and will rebuild them as they were before. I will cleanse them from all their sin that they have committed against me and forgive all their sins of rebellion against me. Then this city will bring me renown, joy, praise, honor before all the nations of the earth that hear the good things I do for it. And they will be in awe of and, and will tremble at the abundant prosperity and peace I provide for it. I love that. They're going to actually shake. This is like so good. I, I can't believe it. You know, it's like, let's say you get married and you're marrying the person of your dreams and like you, you wake up the next morning and they're, they're like next to you and you like touch them. Are they still there? You know, wow, she's still there. She married me. You know, isn't that cool? You know, it's like that is what they're so excited about. You know, in, in terms of looking at this. Now, verse 9, this phrase, joy, praise, honor. What's interesting about that phrase, what book in the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, 
does Jeremiah regularly allude to? It's Deuteronomy. Regularly alludes to Deuteronomy. And so that phrase comes from Deuteronomy. And it shows up in numerous places in Scripture. And so it kind of pops to the person who is familiar with Scripture. But this section is very, very similar to the previous chapter, chapter 32, verses 36 to 44. So we're getting another repetition here. In the first section, repetition, also chapter 32, and in this paragraph, repetition, also chapter 32. Um, when you see repetition in the Bible, it makes you curious, and you say, maybe the Lord is wanting to reinforce this. I like to think on the simplest level. You know, when I see a story that's told, like uh, the story, for example, of Sennacherib the Assyrian coming against Hezekiah. It is recorded in 2 Kings. It is recorded in 2 Chronicles. And it is recorded in Isaiah 36 to 38. That tells me it must be important. If this story shows up three times in Scripture, it's got to be important. So these things are here. I'm going to judge, but then I am going to give mercy. And what you're not seeing here is like, oh, Israel repented of everything. And God says, okay, I changed my mind. No, there's no evidence. He's just going to give mercy. He's just going to show kindness to them. Verse 10. This is what the Lord says. You say about this place, it's a desolate waste without people or animals, referring to Judah under the siege of Nebuchadnezzar. Yet in the towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem that are deserted, inhabited by neither people nor animals, there will be heard once again, once more, and here comes that phrase that's very similar, the joy and gladness, the voices of a bride and bridegroom, the voices of those who bring thank offerings to the house of the Lord, saying, give thanks to the Lord Almighty, for the Lord is good. His love endures forever. For I will restore the fortunes of the land as they were before, says the Lord. So what is the goal of the book of Consolation? It's really to read when you need consolation when you need encouragement. By the way, in the New Testament, if you ever need encouragement, and we all do from time to time, I highly, highly recommend reading Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. Why? Is because Paul says in the longest run-on sentence in the New Testament, everything we have in Christ. It just goes on and on and on. It's so awesome. And it ends with a very famous verse, Now unto him who is able to you know, uh, 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 give us exceedingly and abundantly beyond all that we ask or imagine, be him praise and honor. And you know, It's like this glorious climax to this awesome three chapters. I would call that the New Testament version of the Book of Consolation. But when you read the book of Consolation is when you're going through dark times and you say, Lord, I recognize the sin, but I see the grace and I'm anticipating good things ahead. I am anticipating by faith good things ahead. So this next section mirrors part of the book of Consolation, chapter 31, verse 1 to 14. By the way, these references I'm giving from chapter 32 and chapter 31, they're not in the quiz next week. <laughs> so that, that is not something you need to know. All you really need to pay attention to there is he's repeating himself from what he's already said. He's reinforcing it. Verse 12, this is what the Lord Almighty says. In this place, desolate, without people and animals, in all the towns here will again be pastures for shepherds, to rest their flocks in the towns of the hill country, of the western foothills, and of the Negev, and the territory of Benjamin, in all the villages around Jerusalem, and in all the towns of Judah, flocks will again pass under the hand of the one who counts them, says the Lord. 
the hand of the one who counts him just means a shepherd. In other words, things are going to be good again. And how beautiful that will be. So this contrast, times are dark. Times will be good. And you can anticipate that. Now we move to a passage which we actually preached in church during the Easter, uh, excuse me, the Christmas series. And it was already part of what we learned in Jeremiah. So this passage was previously said in chapter 23. Again, I'm not going to ask you that section, but it's a repeated passage. The days are coming, declares the Lord. Pause there for one moment. This is the Yom Yahweh. Yom means day in Hebrew. And Yahweh is the Lord. I bring this up because for those who take a very literal six-day creation argument, that there are six 24-hour days, it's possible. I'm not saying that's not possible. The Lord can do anything he wants. But what I am saying is the word yam, day, can mean a period of time. And this is an example where it means a period of time. So it doesn't automatically mean a 24-hour day. And when you're looking at the Genesis passage, the sun wasn't even created in the first few days of creation. So you can't use the sun as the measurement of what a 24-hour day looks like. So for anyone who might teach on the internet or you know some sermon you heard, some preacher says, and Yom always means a 24-hour day, hasn't read their Bible. Um, so I don't want to disrespect anyone, but it just means a day or a period of time. And here's an example of a period of time. The days are coming, the Yom Yahweh is coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah. Now, when was this promise made? We could probably point to several areas, but the one I am going to point to, which I'm pretty sure is going to be on a quiz next week, is Isaiah 11. So let me read the promise here, and then we bring up Isaiah 11. In those days, and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do, so this righteous branch is a person, he will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called, the Lord our righteousness. So here is what Jeremiah is probably building off of. Jeremiah, excuse me, Isaiah 11. A shoot will come from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. Now, if you notice on my screen, I have dot, dot, dot. I'm going to verse 10. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him and his resting place will be glorious. In that day, the Lord will reach out his hand for a second time to reclaim the surviving remnant of his people from Assyria, from Lower Egypt, from Upper Egypt, from Cush, from Elam, from Babylonia, from Hamath, and the islands of the Mediterranean. Now, what's really cool in this Isaiah passage is that this one to come comes after David, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. Jesse is David's daddy, by the way, if you don't know that. But then look at verse 10. In that day, the root of Jesse, somebody who precedes Jesse, will stand as a banner for the peoples. So the Messiah both comes before Jesse and comes after Jesse. Who can do that? God. This is a very challenging passage if you come from a Jewish tradition because the Messiah here is described as somebody who precedes David and comes after David. How do you pull that off? So there's another scripture which points us out, which I think is on a quiz that's coming up. 
Revelation 22.16 is the last chapter in the book of uh, Revelation. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. Same thing. This is an example, by the way, of where Revelation alludes to the Old Testament, but doesn't quote it. But if you know Isaiah chapter 11, and you get to Revelation 22, you know what you end up doing is, glory to God, he is so amazing, he's so cool, because you're seeing the scripture fulfilled, and it's like, wow! And if there's any doubt who that Isaiah person is, this is answered here, Revelation 22, verse 16, and you see, wow, the connection. And so what we're seeing is this combination of Isaiah is alluded to in Jeremiah. Isaiah came first, and then Revelation, which comes after, is making the same connection of who is this branch? And then the answer is it's Messiah. Now, this is almost identical to Jeremiah 23, except one significant change. In Jeremiah 23, verse 16 ends this way. This is the name by which he will be called. The Lord, our righteous Savior. Could also be translated, the Lord who saves us. But this, most manuscripts say, this is the name by which it will be called. And that's Jerusalem. So that is the one difference between the 23 passage, uh, chapter 23 and this passage here in chapter 33. And they're really referring to, they're interchangeable in terms of what's going on. But the one makes it specifically that it's Jesus, or I should say Messiah. And the second one, it's also the name of Jerusalem. Now we move, and I, and I need to mention this principle again. In the Book of Consolation, we are looking at Horizon 1, which is the prophet's own world or the New Testament itself. Horizon 2, which is the New Testament world, fulfillment at the time of Christ. Or Horizon 3, which is, remember I like to use big words, show you how smart I am, the eschatological horizon or the last days horizon of the return of Christ and new creation. I'm bringing this up because we're now going to go through a section where we have to have that in mind. So we read this. For this, verse 17, is what the Lord says. David will never fail to have a man sit on the throne of Israel. Nor will the Levitical priests ever fail to have a man stand before me continually to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to present sacrifices. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. This is what the Lord says. If you can break my covenant with the day, excuse me, if you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night so that night no longer come at their appointed time, so that day and night no longer come at the appointed time, then my covenant with David, my servant, and my covenant with the Levites who are priests ministering before me can be broken. And David will no longer have a descendant to reign on the throne. I will make the descendants of David, my servant, and the Levites who minister before me as countless as the stars in the sky and as measureless as the sands on the seashore. Now, simple thing here is, can you break a covenant with the sun rising and the sun setting? And, and this basic point is, it always comes. And as sure as it's going to be day tomorrow and that it is night now, is my promise that David will always, a descendant of David will always reign on the throne. Now here's our little conundrum. Does this have fulfillment in Horizon 1? So they come back from Babylon and they go back to Jerusalem. Do they have a king when they come back? They don't. They have a governor. He's in the family heritage of David, 
but it's a governor, it's not a king. So scholars will say metaphorically it's happening in terms of you know a leader from David's line, but he's not a king. But the New Testament sees this clearly fulfilled in Christ because Christ becomes the permanent reigning son of David for all time, fulfilling in horizon two and horizon three. And so when you're looking at this, you're saying, how is this fulfilled? Well, if it's fulfilled in horizon one, it seems kind of like a wimpy fulfilling. In other words, because there's no defined reigning forever king. But poetically, you could say it's fulfilled or you know, metaphorically. But it seems that the dominant fulfilling in this passage is Horizon 2, New Testament time, in Christ, and Horizon 3, Christ ruling for all, ruling for all time. You know, seeing both of those things happening. Now, this image at the end... Uh, minister before me as the stars in the sky and as measureless as the seashore reminds the biblically trained reader of a promise made to a patriarch Abraham excellent good good thinking there take the wrong question you put in your quiz and you can now make it right I mean no seriously this is Genesis 22, verse 17, and this is on the quiz. Which passage is alluded to, and it's Abraham. Look at the stars, Abraham. Can you count them? And Abraham, no, I can't. So will your descendants be. Look at the sand of the seashore, Abraham. Can you count it? So will your descendants be. And that is a promise we have seen fulfilled. Verse 23, the, Lord came, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Have you noticed these people saying, the Lord has rejected the two kingdoms he chose. So they despise my people and no longer regard them as a nation. This is what the Lord says. If they have not made my covenant, excuse me, if I have not made my covenant with day and night and established the laws of heaven and earth, then I will reject the descendants of Jacob and David, my servant, and will not choose one of his sons to rule over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For I will restore their fortunes and have compassion on them. So God now quotes the previous section and says, I'll tell you what, I make a deal. As, as long as there's a sunrise and a sunset, I am guaranteeing that there will be a descendant of David that will rule over the people, and we will see that result. And thus ends the book of Consolation, which is chapters 30, 31, 32, and 33. If any of you get that wrong next week, <laughs> hang your head in shame because you have heard the answer many, many times tonight as to how long that is. Which now brings us back to reality. Jerusalem is under siege. King Zedekiah. And so here we go, chapter 34. While Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army and all the kingdoms and peoples in the empire he ruled were fighting against Jerusalem. So if you can look at that map here, Everything that's green is around Jerusalem right now. That's a pretty scary picture. Everything that's green in this map is around Jerusalem. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Go to Zedekiah, king of Judah, and tell him. This is what the Lord says. I am about to give the city into the hands of the king of Babylon, and he will burn it down. You will not escape from his grasp, but surely be captured and given into his hands. You will see the king of Babylon with your own eyes, and he will speak with you face to face, and you will go to Babylon. Verse 4. 
Yet hear the Lord's promise to you, Zedekiah, king of Judah. This is what the Lord says concerning you. You will not die by the sword. You will die peacefully. As people made funeral fire in honor of your predecessors, the kings who ruled before you, so they will make a fire in your honor and lament, Alas, Master, I myself make this promise, declares the Lord. Okay. Does that sound like it will be okay for Zedekiah? You'll die in peace. You'll be in captivity, but you'll die in peace. Sounds okay. But let me show you a glimpse of what's actually going to happen. This is Jeremiah 39. So it's skipping ahead. But the Babylonian army pursued them and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. They captured him and took him to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. So he gets to see the king. At Riblah, in the land of Hamath, where he pronounced sentence on him. There at Riblah, the king of Babylon slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes and also killed all the nobles of Judah. Then he put out Zedekiah's eyes and bound him with bronze shackles to take him to Babylon. This, for me, is one of the darkest passages in the Bible because we're seeing such graphic description of a king. I mean, he's not a good king. He's a bad king. But to hear him, you know, seeing his sons killed as the last thing he sees before his eyes are removed is so gruesome. Which brings us back to the passage we just read. You will die peacefully. That doesn't feel very peaceful to me. So what's going on here? Now, first of all, one thing we know, Jeremiah wrote both sections. So Jeremiah is not unaware of the other section. So here's how scholars look at this. When you go back to Jeremiah 27, you might remember this. What is the instruction of the Lord to Zedekiah? Yield to Nebuchadnezzar, and it will go well with you. Don't yield, and it will go horrible for you. Zedekiah never yielded to Nebuchadnezzar. He never yielded. So what you need to do to understand this prophetic word is understand it in light of chapter 27 when grace was offered in the view of surrender. You surrender, you live, you do not surrender, bad things happen. Now, either way, he didn't die until he, you know, he died not violently, he died in prison. But he sure can't, I mean, I would not view that as dying peacefully, you know, in terms of what's going on. So I think the commentators are probably right that it's based on if you obey the, prom the instruction I gave you, which remember how Jeremiah is all jumbled up? Chapter 27 is happening right before this. So we're seeing he had this opportunity. Yield. You live. The people live. Don't yield. Destruction. And so that is, he didn't yield, and then he reaped the whirlwind in terms of what's going on. Verse 6, Then Jeremiah the prophet told all this to Zedekiah, king of Judah, in Jerusalem, while the army of the king of Babylon was fighting against Jerusalem, and other cities of Judah were still holding out. These were the only fortified cities. The two cities holding out? Hmm, these look like possible quiz answers here. Lachish and Azekah, 
or Azaka. Uh, Az How would you pronounce it? Azaka? Anyway, I'm going with Azaka. So here are they are. Here they are. So on this map, you can see Jerusalem. It's kind of the bigger dot, um, kind of in the middle towards the top, right under the big word Benjamin. But if you look towards the Mediterranean Sea, you can see Azaka. And if you look below Azaka, you can see Lachish. These are fortified cities. Now, just a word, what in the world is a fortified city? Uh, you know how after World War I, the French were very paranoid about being attacked by Germany again. I might add, wisely so. But to prevent danger, they built what was called, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, the Maginot Line, were these big concrete fortresses to defend against Germany coming across the border. The problem is Germany had no intention of hitting them straight on. They went through Belgium. And so it, they kind of ignored the Maginot Line. Now, I'm telling you this because when you see fortified cities like this, let's see how long my cord is here. I don't usually do this, but let's see. Okay, so here's Lachish. Now, why did they build a fortified city here? Who cares? Bypass it. This is the Wadi Gravin, this dotted line here. In other words, it's a mountain pass. And you built the fortified city blocking the mountain pass. You cannot take a mechanized army over the mountains. You need to go through the dry riverbeds. Out west, where I'm moving to, they call them a wash. In the Middle East, they call them a wadi. But the wadi Gravin is defended and protected by Lachish. And then the other wadi to come into Jerusalem is protected by Azekah. And so what you see is these cities still remain fighting. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar hasn't conquered them yet. They're fortified. But eventually, they will be conquered. Um, and, you know, that is what's uh, being described here. So, uh, moving on, Zedekiah is, you know, in a tough spot. Clearly, he's surrounded by these armies. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord after Zedekiah had made a covenant with the people in Jerusalem to proclaim freedom for the slaves. Now, every now and then, a bad king can do something good. So what book are we studying now Sunday morning? Exodus. 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 Here is Exodus 21. Verse 2 to 4. If you buy a Hebrew servant, he is to serve you for six years. But in the seventh year, he shall go free without paying anything. If he comes alone, he goes free alone. But if he has a wife when he comes, he, she, go, she is to go with him. If his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the woman and her children shall belong to her master and only the man shall go free. So this is instructions on what's called the year of Jubilee or your chance of getting uh, freedom. So Zedekiah has a brainstorm. This is what he is. Everyone, verse 9, was, uh, was to free their Hebrew slaves both male and female, no one was to hold a fellow Hebrew in bondage. So all the officials and all the people entered into this covenant and agreed that they would free their male and female slaves and no longer hold them in bondage. They agreed and set them free. But afterward, afterward they changed their minds and took back the slaves they had freed and enslaved them again. Very fascinating passage. What's fascinating on several levels, why did he do this? In all the kind of instructions of like Jeremiah, 
He said you didn't care for the poor, you didn't care for the widow, you didn't care for the orphan, you didn't honor the Sabbath. But now, out of the blue, Zedekiah goes, hey, let's all make a covenant to release our slaves. Which, by the way, hasn't been done in centuries. It's like been ignored entirely by God's people. And, and there's like a sense of like, why did you pick this one? To, to do it. Are you hoping to, you know, build, you know, God will forgive you and, you know, turn Nebuchadnezzar away? I mean, that's the only thing I could think of that he's doing it. Uh, maybe it's for other reasons so they can fight in the army because they're, they're you know, under siege and, and only the masters could authorize it and now they'll be free to fight. We don't really know why he picked this. It's just curious. But then what we read, they all change their mind. So now we have a response from the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I made a covenant with your ancestors when I brought them out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. That's intentional. I said, every seventh year, each of you must free any fellow Hebrews who have sold themselves. By the way, this is... You ever hear people use the phrase, the 11th commandment? In other words, you've heard of the 10 commandments. And, you know, some people say, well, the 11th commandment is, and, you know, they're using it as a metaphor. Freeing of the slaves is actually the 11th commandment. It's not in the, the Decalogue, you know, the 10 commandments, but it's the first thing that is mentioned after he gives the 10 commandments. It's free the slaves. After they have served you six years, you must then let them go free. Your ancestors, however, did not listen to me or pay attention to me. Recently, almost like God is surprised, recently you repented and did what is right in my sight. It's like God almost fell off the throne for a second. Is this the same Zedekiah? Each of you proclaimed freedom to your own people. You even made a covenant before me in the house that bears my name. What do we call the house that bears his name? The temple. I'm pretty sure that's on a quiz next week. I am just like giving so much grace. It's like, I, I, should, I should write my quiz always early, you know, and not after the class, but before the class. This is very rare that I, I do that here. Um, but he says, you actually made this in my house. It was like you know, you're in court and you're putting your hand on the Bible. That's, that's what you did. But now you have turned around, no surprise, and profaned my name. Each of you has taken back the male and female slaves that you set free to go where they wished. And you, very strong language here, forced them to become your slaves again. In other words, this was not something they did freely. They, they did not want to go back to their masters, but they were forced to come back. And it, it just... Look at the story and it's like, it's just so strange. Why did they even bother making this covenant and then not follow through with it? A, a question that I can't help but ask myself, if they honored it, would God have acted any different? I don't know. I mean, it seemed pretty for sure that they were going to go into captivity, but it's just curious. It's like, because he celebrated the decision. It was a good decision. You guys decided something that your ancestor didn't do. But now they, they turn around. We move to verse 17. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. You have not obeyed me. You have not proclaimed free pe freedom for your own people. So I now proclaim freedom for you, declares the Lord. Not the kind of freedom they want. Freedom to fall by the sword, plague, famine. That verse is the verse that gives me the impression that
that God may have changed his mind. The reason why he says this connection, you have not obeyed me and have not proclaimed freedom for your own people. So now I'm going to give you freedom, freedom to die. So I can't say that conclusively, but it seems like if they had stuck with it, God would have done something different. What? I don't know exactly, but it seems like he may have done something different. I will make you abhorrent to all the kingdoms of the earth. Those who have violated my covenant and have not fulfilled the terms of the covenant they made before me, I will treat like the calf they cut in two and then walk between its pieces. The leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the court officials, the priests, and all the people in the land who walked between the pieces of the calf will deliver into the hands, I will deliver into the hands of their enemies who want to kill them. Their dead bodies will become food for the birds and the wild animals. Now, something is made reference here, which is kind of confusing. Walk between the pieces. So how did you make a covenant in that day? You actually cut animals in half Place one half over here, one half over here, and both parties would walk through and it would convey the images may what happened to this animal happen to me if we do not honor this covenant. That was the idea of this covenant. But the description of what we just read shows up in scripture in a very pivotal an important section of scripture. It shows up in Genesis chapter 15 with Abraham. When God says to Abraham, I am making a covenant for you to be my people. But what's interesting in that they cut the animals in two, but then there's a fire pot that's like just floating, representing the Lord that goes through the pieces and Abraham never walks through. That God made a one-way covenant. He made the promise himself that he would always have this people for himself, always Abraham's descendants. The reason why I'm pointing this out, besides the fact that I'm pretty sure it's on a quiz next week, <laughs> is that whenever you see this imagery of covenant, it's going to take the Jewish reader, or we who are biblically familiar of the Goyim, the pagans, the, uh, the, the, the Gentiles who found Christ, it's going to take us back to Abraham. Because that's when this was first described in a very powerful way. That makes sense? So we're hearing the description, but it does take the Jewish reader back to Abraham and the covenant. Last verse, uh, two verses for tonight. I will deliver Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his officials into the hands of their enemies who want to kill them, and to the army of the king of Babylon, which has withdrawn from you. I am going to give the order, declares the Lord, and I will bring them back to the city. They will fight against it, take it, burn it down, and lay waste to the towns of Judah so that no one can live there. What's going on? What do you mean they disappeared? Well, it's not told in this section, but I'm going to tell you. And the prudent student would remember this because it's going to be on a quiz next week. <laughs> And here it is. Egypt came to attack Babylon. Egypt is a major nation. Babylon needed to bring all its resources to bear against Egypt. Egypt would not ultimately win. And then Babylon would finish the work in Jerusalem. So who, why'd they go away? The Egyptians had come to attack. 
We don't know it from anything we've read here. I'm telling you because we know it from other passages to let us know what happened. But in this particular case, that is why they disappeared for a while. Egypt was on the way and they needed to respond. So going through these two chapters, Book of Consolation, which finished in chapter 33, which includes chapters 30, 31, 32, 33, and chapter 34, which brings us back to the present day. We're kind of on a bit of a roller coaster ride. We have joy for the future, anticipation of Messiah, but we also see Zedekiah and the failure of his administration, his attempt to make a covenant, and then his reneging on that covenant. And the evil things that happen with covenant breakers happen with Zedekiah. I like this passage because it has things that are mysterious that I don't fully understand that I have to trust the Lord with. And it has things that I do understand, such as Jeremiah 33, 3. Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you don't know. So I want to call upon the Lord. I don't want him to show me those things. And in the end, become the follower that he would have me to be. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we've had to worship you through the study of your word. We pray, Lord, that you will bless everything we've heard and the things that we do not understand. Lord, we, we put them on a shelf for the day that we can see you face to face and ask those questions in that great Bible study in glory. But the things we do understand, honoring covenants, calling upon you, that a Messiah came and he precedes David and, and comes after David. And the hope that resides in this Messiah. Lord, all of these things we pray that we would take in our hearts, own and cherish as we seek to live our lives in honor before you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.